Tonight, we're discussing the midterm elections in which California may well play a pivotal role. What are the chances that Democrats will take back the House, and what would happen if they did? What role would the pre will President Trump play in an attempt to preserve the Republican majority? And what lessons have we gleaned from polling, precedent, and other factors that played a role in our understanding and, at times, our coverage of the 2016 election? Here to lead this discussion is someone who has covered nearly every presidential campaign since 1988. He is our Los Angeles Bureau Chief, who is currently writing a book about the modern history of the New York Times. So please join me in welcoming all my colleagues and Adam Nagurney. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to tonight's program at Inforum in association with the New York Times. I'm Adam Nagurney, uh, the Los Angeles Bureau Chief for the New York Times, and I'm happy to be here discussing California and the 2018 midterm elections with three of my colleagues at the Times. One of our chief national political correspondents, Alex Burns. Next to him, White House reporter Maggie Haberman, part of the team honored with the Pulitzer Prize in April. for its coverage of Donald Trump's advisors to Russia, and Nate Cohn, domestic correspondent for The Upshot, who focuses on polling and is behind the digital probability needle in the New York Times website on most election nights. Thank you. And I'm glad that this is happening on such a slow news week. Which <laughs> did anything happen today? Um, actually, let's start with what happened today. Um, talk a little bit. Um, I guess starting with you, Alex, about, first of all, what you think the uh, resignation, excuse me, the retirement of Justice Kennedy is going to mean in terms of the midterm elections, um, if anything, both in terms of voter turnout, um, energy, fundraising, whatever you think might happen. Well, look, I, you know, on the Republican side, there's been a lot of optimism that something like this would happen because they believe that it'll give their base something to uh, get excited about that the president has obviously had a um, euphemistically speaking rocky uh, year and a half and he doesn't have that much to put in front of the country as as you know a concrete achievement that he campaigned on and then delivered um, a, a solidly conservative Supreme Court would fall into that category and based on where the Senate races are these are a lot of states like North Dakota and West Virginia where another justice like Neil Gorsuch would be a really, really popular uh, achievement for the president and could squeeze some of the Democrats who are up for re-election there. The big asterisk, I think, on all of that uh, is that it will also certainly fire up uh, liberals as well. Uh, and if an issue like abortion rights suddenly comes to the middle of the midterm election, that could have implications in the battle for the Senate, it could have implications in the battle for the House, where Republicans are already uh, really terrified of uh, the losses that they've felt among uh, women, particularly white women, uh, particularly white women with college degrees, uh, for whom that's a, ver a very, very significant issue. Maggie, do you think that there's any chance that the Senate is at play this year? And could this issue play in, could the, the, the fact that the Supreme Court battle play into this? Keeping in mind that Mitch McConnell said today that he's going to do the vote, he's gonna, he's, they're going to confirm by election day. Yeah, I mean, I do, I think the Senate is less in play than the House is, um, but, and most strategists who I talk to think that it is not. A, a couple of very smart strategists believe that there is, uh, there is wiggle room there, and I think that, uh, just to expand on what Alex said, um, this is going to galvanize in both directions, right? Um, I think that we don't really know yet um, there's two X factors for the next four months, uh, and I've had a lot of conversations with people about this today. One is um, the hearings uh, to confirm someone to replace Kennedy, and the expectation is the White House will have a pick pretty fast within the next couple of weeks. Um, they will have this done um, by the time uh, the Supreme Court's next session begins, I think in October. Um, and then the other big question mark is, is there a report from Robert Mueller, the special counsel, before uh, the midterm elections, and mm -hmm. I think those are the, the two main main things to watch. I do think that however this goes with the Supreme Court would play a role. I, I think there's a lot um, of hope uh, being rested on the idea um, that two senators, Collins and Murkowski, might end up not voting um, for a, a conservative pick uh, based on their stand on Roe v. Wade. 
I think that it is likelier that they will end up voting, um, you know, with Republicans, and uh, and we will see what the fallout is. Could they pick up some Democrats as well, I mean, I, like they did with Gorsuch? Is uh, possible? I think that they could, and I think that there are enough content. The map is not great for Democrats, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I think that um, there is an open question as to whether Schumer is going to be able to hold his conference. And this is the um, uh, sort of the flip side of the political equation for Republicans. It's not just that the uh, nomination could fire up the left, is that it could also give some of these red state Democrats the opportunity to side with sure. Trump on something, right? So you already have people like Joe Donnelly and Joe Manchin, the senators from Indiana and West Virginia, who are going around talking about how, you know, I was against the president on health care, but I was with him on Justice Gorsuch, right? If they get to do that again right before the election, um, that right. would certainly anger Democrats who don't live in West Virginia, uh, but it could be hugely helpful to them in their own campaign. That's right. Nate, from your perspective, do you think this changes the dynamic? I mean, I think you've thought also thought that the Senate, a Senate takeover by Democrats is unlikely, is, right? It's less likely than, than the House, certainly, but, you know, it's, it's totally possible. It is, okay. Uh, I mean, can't, incumbents who represent the party that opposes the president have won in, I think, every midterm contest going back for 30 years. So it wouldn't stun me if the Democrats could run the table in these really conservative states, and they could potentially improve their message by uh, backing the president um, on his nominee. And they could have their cake and eat it too, where they're still benefiting from an enraged Democratic base, and yet at the same time they can reach out to moderate Republican voters. So you can imagine some ways things play out for them. I mean, it's still hard. There are so many seats that they have to win. You know, they have to really run the table. Um, but, you know, the Democrats needed to run the table in 2006, and at this time we would have said that it was very difficult for them to, you know, hold all of the vulnerable Democratic seats and flip s seats like Montana or Virginia and Missouri, and they did. Uh, so I wouldn't rule it out. And I think that, you know, it's a, the, the, these senators are in an interesting position where they can, you know, potentially improve their overall spot. So given that, why do you guys think that McConnell is pushing, um, except to stick it in the Democrat's face, pushing to have a vote uh, by fall? Because it sounds like it cuts both ways in terms of helping him or hurting him in terms of keeping the majority. Well, McConnell is very sensitive to the possibility that the House may flip, mm -hmm. at which point any possibility of major conservative legislation passing, and probably any major legislation at all, uh, essentially evaporates, right? So... Uh, this could be the last chance to, the last chance for Congress to have a part in really achieving something lasting uh, for the right. Uh, McConnell has said in interviews that he considers Gorsuch to be Gorsuch and the appellate courts and the circuit courts uh, that they have um, uh, approved so many nominees for to be the most important thing the Senate has done uh, under President Trump, which is a striking thing uh, because it essentially uh, sidelines everything that the House of Representatives has been involved in, including uh, the tax cut law. Uh, McConnell and other Republican senators are very aware of the reality that the next time Democrats control Congress, all of that can be repealed easily. That's not the case with the Supreme Court seat. Maggie, do you have a sense of, um, I had assumed that Trump, it's, no, it's not exactly a shock that Kennedy stepped down. I mean, there's lot, lots of rumors about this happening, and I mean, I think like everyone today was sort of waiting to see if that happened. I would have expected that Trump already has a list of people, maybe even a strain. Do you have any idea yeah, he about that? No, he definitely has a list. I mean, I think the, the question that we don't have an answer to yet is um, whether Trump himself sort of played a uh, some kind of a tacit role in getting Kennedy to step down now, right? I mean, I mm -hmm. think that Trump has um, openly talked about how he might be, able, uh, he has told people, I could have four uh, seats that I fill um, during his time as president. So I think that was very appealing to him. He does know, to Alex's point, that this is one of the accomplishments that was seen as good um, among among conservatives and evangelicals was getting Neil Gorsuch through. Um, he said today that, he, you know, he, one of the things he did during the campaign to try to reassure conservatives who based on his very long history of statements um, that were not conservative, um, to reassure them that he would uh, be with them, he put out this list that was um, uh, done with uh, a group of, of people who had spent a lot of time um, on the judiciary in terms, of, in terms of picks and who would be good nominees. And it was about, I think it was 25 people. And Gorsuch came from that list. Um, and he said today that he would, he would stick with the people who are on that list. It's not a 24 person list, it's more like a six to eight person list. Mm -hmm. Because it's Trump, you mm -hmm. cannot rule out the possibility uh, that there will be some curveball thrown in. Um, uh, the name that uh, 
we hear repeatedly is Judge Kavanaugh, who's a Bush appointee. He was also uh, George W. Bush's White House Staff Secretary. Uh, and given Trump's level of paranoia about the Bushes, I'm not confident that that's going to be where he would go, but, but it's hard to say. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Crowley primary, the results that happened last night did, um, in Queens. Did any of you see it coming, first of all? I'm, I'm not put, I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, no, not do, at all. <laughs> so I did. So. Yeah, well, I live in Brooklyn, so that's my okay. excuse. No, um, <laughs> no, I didn't look. That's I didn't, closer that's to Queens than Los Angeles. I didn't, I, just, I, didn't <laughs> see it's, I didn't see it coming, and I, I, I really have not been paying close enough attention to um, the, uh, some of the New York races uh, recently. I probably should have seen it coming, right? Ryan Graham at, at The Intercept. Um, reminded me that I had done a blog post when Alex and I were at Politico in 2010 uh, about how Crowley was lobbying very hard to keep his district carved in a certain way where it would not be um, majority Hispanic or um, plurality Hispanic uh, because he saw what was likely to happen at some point. Um, it, Crowley hadn't had any a real race in a really long time and anytime you have that as you know in New York in particular mm -hmm. um, which has a history of sort of waiting for these very old young guns who are ascendant to take over. Um, Crowley was a, a possible next House sp uh, Speaker of the House. Um, he, he, there's, a, there's a rust that sets in to the New York political machine and, you know, and he was facing um, an appealing Latina candidate um, at a moment when I think that uh, there's an organic and authentic energy among women voters uh, to elect women. And I think so gender uh, was a factor. I think gender was a factor, yeah, but I also think that this was a vote that took place uh, in the middle of the uh, the border crisis, and right. I think that can't That's be ignored either. Yeah. So, it, was there any was there any polling in this district that, that you know of? Or certainly, no public. So I think polling. that we just reported, and I didn't get a chance to fully read the article, but I think we just reported that a Crowley poll conducted well before the election had him over fifty percent with a thirty point lead or something. Thirty six. Now, one thing I'll say about that, and this is a little bit arcane, is that the, the turnout in this election was like 25,000 votes. Mm -hmm. right. And if you conduct a poll nowadays, about 5% of people respond. Right. And there are like, you know, probably 150,000 telephone numbers in this district. So like they, you know, you can't do a full poll of people who actually voted. Mm -hmm. Like if you even, if you sample the people that voted in this election, you might get you might be able to get a pull out of it, maybe. I mean, it's just really hard to pull these sort of contests. So, you know, they're pulling in a lot of people who aren't political activists, who aren't engaged, and so, you know, that's why we keep having these huge surprises in primaries, because just, it's just too hard to, to really hone in on the real electorate. Um, one thing that, you know, it's, this is basically what Maggie said, but I just, I just feel like if Crowley hadn't been an incumbent who was extremely well positioned in leadership, there would be nothing surprising about what happened in this election. Like, across the board, she was a better fit for this district in terms of ideology, in terms of being a fit for the political moment, mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of the district's demographics. So, you know, this is not an election where, like, you know, we should have to wonder, like, how did this happen? You know, it's, there's, there's almost no shortage of reasons how it could have happened. But if I can, I mean, I would push back on that just a little bit. Um, uh, you know, before I covered uh, national politics for the paper, I, I was on the Metro desk, and, and I'm also a New York native, like uh, three of the people on the panel. And this kind of thing doesn't happen in New York, right? That it is, a, it is a, uh, an amazingly sort of rigid, um, like tedious political culture that doesn't embrace dynamism and doesn't make it easy to run for office or to vote or to register to vote. Uh, so it's, you know, while on paper, I guess if that district were in California, I'm not just pandering to you. If that district were, <laughs> if that district were in California and this happened, I would say yes, no, that makes sense because yeah. you know that's how they do things out there. Um, <laughs> but but in New York, it's, it's not how we do things. And and I would I would also say, you know, I think there was a broader phenomenon in New York City that's sort of an interesting moment that we haven't fully sort of unpacked yet. That yeah, Joe Crowley was the guy who lost. Um, but a couple districts over, Yvette Clark, uh, who's a you know longtime incumbent in Brooklyn, African American woman uh, from a local political dynasty, you know, not a pushover, not somebody who was sort of demographically or ideologically mismatched to her district, barely won renomination by about a little over a thousand votes against a guy who's uh, unfortunately younger than me, uh, and 
had never run for office before, right? Carolyn Maloney, who uh, represents uh, mostly uh, the Upper East Side of Manhattan and a little bit of Queens, um, w won renomination with less than 60% of the vote against a first-time candidate, a young man uh, who had never run for office before. So there's something going on, uh, as the president would say, uh, in, in New York City. Uh, and I think Joe Crowley is somebody who should have been sophisticated enough to see it coming. Well, that, that, to push back on the pushback just mildly. Yeah. That, like, so I, I, <laughs> I agree with you that um, I, certainly ID, uh, demographically, obviously, he is not a great fit for his district anymore. And the district outgrew him, essentially. And he was aware that that was coming. Um, but ideologically, he is pretty well suited. I mean, he's pretty liberal, Joe Crowley. Um, and I think that what ends up happening in the in the sort of um, surface veneer of describing these races, I don't mean us, I mean how it gets described in national coverage is, you know, well, there was a, a centri liberal versus a centrist, or an and that's, that's not really what this was. Um, Joe Crowley also made, to your point about being more attuned to it, he sent a, a stand-in to his debate with her, I think it was like nine days ago or something like that. That really doesn't play well, so. Um, so you guys might have kind of answered this, but I want to pull the lens up a little bit. Um, does this mean anything for the Democratic Party? Like, if we, I, if we were having this discussion about the Tea Party, about um, um, it, um, Eric Cantor back in 2010 or whenever it was when he lost. Does this have that kind of significance in terms of Democrats now facing turmoil over the next few months? Clearly, a after the midterm, they probably will. But do you think they do? Is there a big ideological battle signaled by this? Or is the left sort of taking over? I think that battle has, has been happening, right? Okay. Um, I, I do think this is a Cantor-like moment, um, but the consequences are gonna be a little deferred because Cantor lost and Republicans had control of the House, right? And it immediately changed mm -hmm. their governing agenda and the way they were all approaching primaries. This should be a, a sort of loud warning shot into the air for other incumbents who have primaries yes. uh, coming up. But I think the really, really big impact and talking to people in Washington today, uh, the big draw, um, the, the big lesson they're drawing from it is there is an enormous um, moment of generational change happening in the party. And this sense in the House a couple weeks ago that maybe they could um, you know, take control of Congress and then reelect their uh, leadership team of entirely people who are uh, well into their 70s and have been in those roles for over a decade. Um, there's less confidence that... Is that right? Do you think that Nancy Pelosi might not survive then? Or you, there's, there's very, very remember significant... Remember what city we're in, okay? Right. So, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, folks, yeah. but there, there is very significant uh, skepticism in the House among her colleagues that she is going to be able to win that vote. You know, the great likelihood, the good news, the great, uh, you know, the good news for... Uh, the audience, uh, the great likelihood is that California would have to be represented uh, in a new Democratic leadership team. Mm -hmm. It just represents too much of uh, the caucus not to be, um, and maybe even somebody Nancy Pelosi chooses. And she could still hang on, uh, but they're much, much less confident of that than they were a week ago. Let's take this to California. Um, the June 5th primary, you guys, were, you were out here for it. Did it leave the Democrats in a better or worse position, just in the races here going into November, and then we'll take it to the national scene, do you think? It would leave them in a worse position than what? Better or worse, but the Democratic primaries, did they end up, the primaries here on June 5th, are Democrats in a better position with the outcome of them, do you think? Better candidates or? I think that they basically came out as expected. I think that the results themselves might have been a little worse for the Democrats in one particular district, the 21st district, which is mm -hmm. David Vallejo's seat, goes from Fresno down to Bakersfield, and he won by like 30 points. And you know, there are a lot of people who talk about Democrats getting seven seats out of California, and that one looks really tough, and I think that was a real surprise to me. Um, and in terms of the specific candidates they got through, you know, I think it was a pretty, I think it was basically the group of candidates that were expected. So I, I don't think it materially like changed their, their shot of winning any of these individual seats. Did it give you any insight onto the Democrats' perspe perspective of winning the House, just in terms of, again, energy, turnout? The turnout was big. You know, I, I, I didn't check last night. I mean, they were still counting votes, I guess. It's like 300,000 votes. Left. Yeah, they'll, get, they'll be done by the year 2000. They were up to almost 7 million the last time I checked, like 6, 6,950,000 or whatever. And, you know, that's right. almost as much as it turned out for the general election in 2014. So, you know, primary turnout is almost always dwarfed by the general election turnout. So, you know, that gives you a sense of what the turnout is going to be in November. And, and it's and not going to be like it was in 2014. And heavy, two points here. One is... 
a lesson again for all of us. Don't make projections about conclusions about turnout in California the day after the election. Everyone I saw so many stories about low turnout. I'm like, they're not the votes aren't even counted yet. But the second thing is it's heavy Democratic. As I, saw, I think in your story or your story, heavy Democratic turnout, right? That's right. And that's the pattern we're seeing all across the country, that Democrats are, you know, turnout in primaries, you can look at the results and see only only 30 percent of people mm -hmm. turned out. That's pathetic. And it is. But if you look at the pattern overall, comparing 2018 to 2014, the turnout among the share of the vote that is Democrats is consistently going up in uh, districts that have competitive primaries and the share of the vote that is Republican is, you know, more or less flat. Uh, that's a big indicator that you're looking at. Um, you know, an enthusiasm gap in the general election, the kind of thing uh, that can lead to a wave election. It's the reverse of the pattern we saw between 2006 and 2010, when you saw Democrats kind of checking out of their primaries in 2010 and Republican voters really flock into the polls. So what's your sense? Do you think, what's your best guess of whether or not the Democrats take back the House? You know I'm not going to answer that. Okay. Didn't we just but talk about not predicting things? <laughs> you are. Know, I, I actually, I w w will answer so, in a sort of strange way, which is that I think that the primary results so far, what we saw in California and what we see in all of the polling suggests the Democrats are going to have like a great year. They're going to win the popular vote by a lot. Mm -hmm. um, whether they're going to actually cobble together 24 to, or rather 23 seats, we don't know that yet. I mean, we, there just aren't enough polls district by district to know whether individual candidates are going to break through. And we might not know that for a long time. But what really strikes me, and this gets back to the Supreme Court conversation, is that, you know, because the Republicans have so many structural advantages in this election between gerrymandering and the tendency for Democrats to run up the score in places like this and then lose the rest of the country by a little bit um, because the Republicans have the advantage of incumbency. You know, it's easy to imagine how the Democrats win the popular vote by a wide margin, fall a little bit short of retaking the House, and then suddenly the Democrats have, the president, have lost the presidency without the popular vote. They probably lost the Senate in this scenario while winning the popular They're vote. Call an ambulance pretty soon. Yeah, the right. Uh -huh. <laughs> they will. They will have won the House popular vote by a comfortable margin. The Republicans will be hanging on by like five seats, and the Republicans will have a Supreme Court that they elected with two Republican presidents who didn't win the popular vote. One of which decided by a Supreme Court decision, and uh, one of the Democratic presidents over the last 30 years who did win the popular vote and one did not get to select one of the nominees that uh, they had a shot to select, or one of the justices that they had a shot, that they did nominate. Um, and that would be a very interesting picture for the state of American democracy heading into the 2020 presidential election. Maggie, um, can you talk a little bit about Trump? What, what is he thinking? In no, I can't talk on that topic. <laughs> 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 What is the president thinking in terms of the chances of losing the House? And is he going to do anything? Or can, I, or can he? I mean, I'm wondering. <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, what, can, you send him, what, can you send him into state? I mean, can you send him into Yeah, so he's... Um, he's got like 30... I mean, generously, he's got a 45% approval rating. And I'm probably less, but... Yeah, I, look, I mean, he, the, the problem with him, I mean, to your point, is like, is he going to do anything? It's like he's going to do lots of things. And <laughs> it's very hard to know exactly what those will be for his advisors. And it's very hard to know whether they will be at cross purposes with what the GOP leadership wants him to do and what um, his own advisors want him to do. Um, he, there's six um, states with Senate contest, competitive Senate contests that they want to send him to, just mm -hmm. sort of as, a, as what one White House advisor told me is lather, rinse, repeat. I'm just going to keep sending him there over and over. But we're also going to send him to a couple of other places like North Dakota tonight, um, like Montana the other day, uh, to try to crack the perception that there is a limit to the number of places he can go, even though they know there's a limit to the number of places he can go. Um, and look, to be clear, Obama had some of this too in 2014, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's that you have um, these competing cross currents on the down ballots where the incumbent president can end up both stirring up you know, a lot of supporters and then, and then a lot of detractors and make it harder for uh, the people who are, are running in, in local races or in house races. Um, so you will see him doing travel and they also want to get him out of the White House and he wants to get out of the White House. Uh, he likes the campaign travel, that's his, that's his thing. Um, and he's feeling, look, I mean, this is to Alex's point about the euphemistically rocky first year and a half of the White House. They've had, um, they've had a decent, couple of days in their minds, right? I mean, they were very happy with the Supreme Court ruling on the third version of um, the travel ban. Mm -hmm. They were very happy um, with uh, the Kennedy retirement. Um, you know, he is feeling, uh, he is feeling very good right now and he wants to 
um, he wants to chest thump a bit. Um, and so I think that you're going to see more of that. In terms of what he wants on, on where the House goes, um, his advisors have repeatedly stressed to him that, you know, uh, even, a, even a narrowly held GOP majority in the House will be a good thing for him, that Democrats getting control will be problematic for him. Um, he likes the idea of divided government, and I think part of it is he just likes to fight, and part of it is that he likes to have somebody who he can blame. We've heard him since going back to the first health care bill loss repeatedly say he's just going to blame Democrats. And um, it has worked to some extent with, with uh, his followers. Um, so I think that he is uh, aware of the concerns of GOP leaders. I think he's not convinced it will happen. And I think he's not convinced it's bad for him. And that's the part he cares about. And that would make him less likely to go out and campaign. Or yeah, well, I'm not even convinced. Look, I think in, in, most, in most House contests, I don't think people really want him coming. I mean, I think I that you will, you will see some, you will see some statewide, um, some states where he will go in, particularly red states, where he'll go in and uh, you might see a House candidate who, for whom he's a net positive um, by a large margin, come join the rally and say hi. But there are very few cases where he's going to go in and do a rally for someone. He's just going to kind of show up and people will gravitate toward the center or not. Uh, I mean, him, him being the center of gravity. But you're not going to see him campaigning for individual House members very often. Dan Donovan, New York uh, 11 in Staten Island, was, mm -hmm. a, was a, a rare exception. But that's Trump's hometown. Um, uh, Trump does very well in Staten Island. And the White House considered it something of a test of whether you could see the power of his endorsement. And look, I think at the end of the day, you probably had a number of voters who thought that um, the uh, challenger, Michael Graham, who used to have that seat, you know, he's a convicted felon. Um, and so that might have made some people stay away from him. But that wasn't clear right off the bat that that was going to, that that was going to do the trick. Um, uh, Dan Donovan, the incumbent, won by a lot. So they're, they're, they, they think that there is some sign that there is a, a value to his endorsement. That doesn't mean he has to bear hug everybody. Well, overall, do you guys think that he's more of a burden or a help to can Republican candidates in this midterm? It's just, I, I don't think it's even close that he's much, much more of a burden yeah, than, I than a help. And even in some of these states that he carried right. uh, in 2016 at the Senate level, he has put Republicans with some of his policies in actually not a great position. That's that, right. You know, some of the stuff that he has done, like immigration restriction, like tax cuts, is popular across most of the Senate map. Uh, and then there's stuff like uh, a trade war right. that directly affects agricultural states and certain uh, manufacturing uh, sectors. You know, Scott Walker, who's running for re-election as governor of Wisconsin, does not need a feud uh, between the Republican president of the United States and Harley Davidson. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, Kevin Kramer, the president's candidate for the, the candidate the president personally recruited to run for Senate in North Dakota, uh, does not need his Democratic opponent, Heidi Heitkamp, the incumbent, to be able to run around the state saying, listen, I was with him on Neil Gorsuch, but where I'm not with him is you know, jamming our farmers, right? It's giving Democrats uh, fodder that they didn't have before and that no Republicans essentially no Republicans outside the White House wanted to have that fight uh, anyway. In the House, as Maggie said, it's, I mean, it's just not even a close call. Uh, Republicans feel that the president is toxic in most of the districts that will decide control the House of Representatives. They don't just feel that, they know it based on data. Mm -hmm. uh, and just going into these districts, it's palpable. Uh, and they do see that the enthusiasm among Democrats to turn out is just staggering. And Republicans, while the president is mostly popular with Republicans, there is a degree of ambivalence about him yep. among a certain segment of self-identified Republican voters who, you know, they might show up to vote for Trump against Hillary Clinton, but it's not clear they're right. gonna show up to vote for you know, Dana Rohrabacher in a House right. race just because Trump tells them to. That's right, I think, and I would add to that too, that an, another additional layer of problem that he has created for these House members is you saw it today where the so-called compromise immigration bill mm -hmm. like suffered a staggering defeat. Um, this is a bill that first the president was mealy mouth maybe for, then he tweeted, don't bother, they should let this go. And then t today or last night, I don't remember when it was because time is non-existent anymore, but he tweeted something like, you know, they should really vote for this bill. And so this is now like the third or fourth time he has done this to them, where they go out on a limb and he saws off the limb. And they're now going to have to, um, exp you know, it's going to hurt them in terms of whether they would 
go out there for him. And now a lot of them are going to go back home, potentially face getting screamed at in town halls. A lot of them have competitive races. It's just, it just creates an untenable situation where, again, only Trump wins. So. We saw during some of these Republican primaries, we saw television advertisements where the candidates sort of align themselves with Trump. Would you A, expect any Republican candidates in this general election to run ads like that? And B, would you expect Democrats to run ads that, par that do the opposite? Because that's one good way of measuring how people are. To align with Trump? Yeah. Said? I mean, look, I think that it's going to be, I mean, Dallas's point, I think that in, in, in red states, you're going to see Heidi Heitkamp air, run, air ads that'll say, like, I was with him on XYZ. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you will see Republicans where, you know, Trump is, is a, a sizable net positive. Um, run ads with him. I, I, don't, um, I don't think we know yet quite how, how toxic um, the border separation issue is going to be um, lingering into the fall, but I think based on uh, the reactions that I have heard from, from people on the Hill in D.C., um, it, it's pretty bad. I mean, this is something that, that plays, um, especially in these, in these swing suburban districts, it plays really poor. I, mean, I hate the word plays because we're talking about children being separated from their parents, but, but it, it is, it is um, impacting people. And they were, so I can't really see a lot of candidates airing I'm with Trump ads unless it is just a clear positive. They're, they're, it's so radioactive in some ways. You could, you could see this totally bifurcated campaign where right. most Republican nominees for yes. Senate right. uh, in the competitive races are running ads saying, I stand with Trump, my That's opponent right. will not, and most Republican candidates for the House in competitive races are running ads about how I stood up to Trump on X. You know, I voted against uh, the tax bill that would have you know, hurt, hurt this district or, right. or against you know, repealing um, health care. We've not seen you know, the trap that Republicans in these suburban areas are in. We saw this last year. Uh, in the governor's race in Virginia, is that if they side too closely with the president, they will lose like every undecided yes. uh, college-educated white woman in the district. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they break with the president, then they have a total insurrection in their own party. And yeah. it's really nobody in the party has any remote solution that's to how right. to deal with that problem. That's that's right. Right. One thing that's interesting to me about the House map right now is that a lot of the best Democratic recruits have, oddly enough, come in Trump country. And in the most conservative districts, um, you know, to, to take a few famous ones, like in Kentucky, sixth district, Amy McGrath has made a huge splash, and you know she leads in most of the polls right now, even though Trump won that district by, you know, more than ten points. Um, you know, there's another famous ad going around from M.J. Hager in Texas's 31st district, which also voted for Trump uh, by more than ten. And you know, if you look at like the top 60 or so most competitive districts, I think about 15 or 20 of them voted for Trump by more than eight or nine points. So there's, there is in these house battle, across the House battlegrounds a subset of districts where Trump could be a net positive. Now, I, I don't know that he is for sure because you know, he's not that popular. And so maybe even in districts where he won by 10 points, you, you know, it's not an overwhelmingly positive thing to be behind the president. The electorate's also going to be better educated than it was in the presidential election, and well-educated voters tend uh, to be skeptical of the president. Um, but the Democrats do need some of these Trump districts, given that they need 23 to win the House. There are 25 mm -hmm. uh, seats that uh, are held by Republicans that Clinton carried, and the Democrats are just probably not going to be able to go 23 out of 25 in those districts. So they're going to have to win in some, Trump, in some districts that were carried by Trump they can see those opportunities now with the recruits they have. And there will be candidates, not a huge number, but there will be some number of candidates, potentially even in districts that really matter because of the quality of the Democratic recruits, where backing the president um, could be their only card to play. What do you, um, what's your sense of what the president's base of support is now? I mean, we've seen, with the cabinet, we've seen signs, I think, that, he, that they, he's able to rally them around. We saw it that now, and that he's able to rally them around it. But how, how big is it? How solid and is it? I think it? it's like a layer. There's, to me, it's like a layer cake. You know, there's this first layer, like the real Trump support, the hats and everything. You know, they're like 23, 25, something like that percent of the electorate. And they're going to vote for him, whatever. And I think that they're, yeah, I mean, you know, they're a big chunk of the electorate. In some districts, there are a lot of it, like in a, in a Kentucky 6 uh -huh. or West Virginia, there are more than that. And in some places, there, or Staten Island, the Repub it's like the whole Republican Party there is close to that category at this point. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you know, it's about as good as it gets for Trump in terms of what share of the Republican base likes him. And then there's you know, another 15% that maybe didn't vote for him in the general election, uh, rather in the primary. And I think Alex alluded to this group already, but they, they maybe don't like the president's conduct. They like his views on taxes and the Supreme Court, but they're, they're probably not really all that 
you know, in line with him on immigration or trade. Um, they don't oppose it. They don't oppose his views on that like strongly enough to vote for a Democrat or something. You know, if they did, they wouldn't support him in the first place. But you know, that there's a there's then a marginal group of support that you know, although a lot of Democrats might hope or believe that they would be inclined to support a Democrat, they've still stuck with him. You know, basically at every point in his presidency, and that you know, combine the two groups, and now you're up near 40 percent, uh, maybe even over. You know, who who knows exactly? I mean, there's it's a blurry line, right? I mean, the layer cakes are not. Perfectly, it's not perfectly clean cut, um, but it's a it's a big chunk of the country overall, and it plays up in a, in you know a low turnout election potentially too. So does he go into the general election in 2020, assuming he's going to run again, um, with 40 percent assured? I mean, I, is that too strong? I mean, I'm, I I could be wrong with this because you know it may just be recency bias of you know growing up in an era where almost all of our president or all of the presidential elections in my lifetime have been decided by. Uh, less than 10 points, mm -hmm. but like I'm sort of inclined to think that just about anybody comes in at 40 percent nowadays. Is that as I'm wondering whether that's polarizations that yeah, I, mean, I feel like that's the floor. That's the floor. Okay. I mean, I, I could be wrong. I mean, the next election could prove that completely wrong. The economy could collapse. Trump could, you know, be running for re-election despite Mueller stuff. And, you know, he didn't get impeached because of the Senate. And, you know, like he's just in a truly toxic situation. I guess that's possible. But, you know, in, in, and in recent memory, I would think that there's not much basis to think you can drop much below that in a... Below 40. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. Okay. Alex, what kind of impact do you... I know this is really speculative, but that's what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> do you, <laughs> would you expect the yeah. Mueller, whatever the Mueller report... What, what are you expecting from Mueller in terms of report? What kind of impact do you think it might have in the midterms? Because we're assuming something's going to come out before November, right? Right. We're assuming that he will say something. Okay. Uh, and the... Nature. I mean, this is, this is where, I mean, speaking of uh, pushing me out on a limb and then sawing it off um, <laughs> behind me, uh, <laughs> you know, we're expecting that he will say something. We're expecting that he will say something that will not be hugely uh, flattering to the president um, personally and to his administration. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, Maggie can probably speak to this um, more than I can. Um, then it really starts to be a question of, you know, does he make an impeachment referral? Does he indict people in the president's family? Does he exonerate people who are currently seen uh, as, as under a cloud of suspicion? And then, you know, do Republicans break ranks around uh, the issues that Mueller raises? And do Democrats sort of hold the line they're at right now? Right. which is saying this is very serious, we need to investigate it, Congress should have the power of oversight, um, but you know, impeachment, let's not go there yet. Um, you know, d does that start to change? Do Democrats start talking about impeachment? The view uh, among Democratic leaders, including uh, uh, possibly the next uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, um, is that imp talking about impeachment is, is terribly counterproductive for them, that they have issues like uh, health care to run on that are you know, that have broad, broad appeal, and that if you make this uh, election not just a referendum on do you like the president, uh, but do you want to remove the president, right. mm -hmm. um, that they think that that, that totally uh, cuts against their own political interests. But, you know, depending on what Mueller says, that could be a hard line for them to hold. And Maggie, do you think it's a tricky thing for Democrats as well for that reason? I do. Um, I do. I mean, I think Alex laid it out pretty succinctly that the, the issue of impeachment has... Um, not been talking about it now has not been particularly appealing um, to most of the Democratic leadership um, because, among other things, I mean, it is going to, it will really rally up Trump's sort of defend me um, call to his own his own supporters, and that has tended to work for Trump. And he's hardly, he's not the first president in history who would do that either, but um, but it, it does, it, it does have an impact. Um, but I don't think we know um, what is going to be in this report. I don't think that we know Assuming it, I don't even know that it's going to come before you don't know. Okay. November. I mean, okay. I think, look, what we know is that in the next week or so, Rudy Giuliani is extremely likely, and by extremely likely, I mean going to say that the president will not be interviewed, or will not submit to an interview, and they're essentially daring Mueller to subpoena him. Um, and there, there is a split on the Trump legal team as to whether Mueller will actually go ahead and do that. He's a, Mueller is a fairly conservative uh, viewer of the of the law, but I think that um, he also takes his charge very seriously. And then the question becomes, does he want to quickly put out a report before um, a window that would get into sort of James Comey pre-election territory? And I think he wants to avoid that. Do you think, and this is sort of connected to that, do you think the whole, these episodes of democratic shaming that we're seeing, the red hen, uh, you know, the booing at the restaurants and stuff, 
is that count? If you if you if your view is that the, what Democrats want to accomplish is winning the House, is that counterproductive to that campaign? I don't know. I mean, I, I think that it's. Um, I don't. Is that is that related to the Mueller question? I think that. Um, <laughs> um, the, I, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there is disagreement on whether this is wise politically, and I think um, Jonathan Martin captured it pretty effectively in our paper, which is that there is a generational, primarily generational split on this. Older um, Democrats think that it is counterproductive. They think that it echoes too much of a pastime when, um, in the civil rights era, when people were kicked out of restaurants. Um, younger Democrats feel, um, who I have spoken to, feel a real sense of, of helplessness and anger and feel like this is the, um, the best way to mobilize. Um, I, I think that you can make the argument in either direction. I think the danger for Democrats is that somebody might get hurt. And if somebody gets hurt, then I'm not really sure uh, what the impact is of that. I just want to jump in on that, that there is also some ambivalence about, among Republicans about this, too, that yes, they don't like absolutely. the, the I mean, they, they feel like it's unfavorable to Democrats to have these images of yes. sort of the out of control yeah. left, right? But when you think about, you know, the way the White House has sort of seized on this issue and, and you know, the restaurant that asked Sarah Sanders to leave did not like make a big commotion no, about this and promote it themselves. It's Sarah Sanders. Uh, sort tweeted of from, this. from a government Twitter feed, right. three million people. So the thing it. that makes Republicans sort of outside the White House nervous about this is that, you know, they think that there is a segment of the electorate that doesn't care for sort of right. liberals uh, gone wild. Um, but they're not sure that there's that big a constituency for sort of defending the president and his friends on a personal I level. I think that's right. Right. I and if your right. message about the midterms, you know, Republicans on the Hill want to make this about sort of the conservative agenda right. and they want to make it about rejecting Democrats right. ideas on right. government run health care and and tax hikes and things like that. Um, they don't think that there's a, a, a great message in, um, you know, stop the Democrats from being mean to White House staffers. Right. I think that's I think that's right. I think that the one the one the one other point I would add to this and this is actually not about the, the public shaming. Um, but I think that um, you are going to see this White House, I think, try to tidy up some loose ends in the coming weeks. I think a major one is um, Scott Pruitt, uh, where I expect you will see that get dealt with. Um, but where are I, I guess no, he's, just he's reporting, being nominated just to the reporting, Supreme Court. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, think that, I think that they are... I think that while well, the president <laughs> really likes Pruitt personally um, and enjoys talking to him and had for a while seen him as a potential um, Jeff Sessions replacement for attorney general, I think that he um, believes... <laughs> just, just, just let me finish. Another Supreme Court nominee. <laughs> um, I, think that, um, I think that he... Uh, there, is, there, there is a growing realization that um, this is just an albatross around their necks. Um, for just, it's like a big neon sign that says corruption um, going into November. Maggie, what took so long? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, that, it's just that, right? Okay. It's that the president likes him. It's that the and he's stubborn on this kind of stuff? Cause, he's, uh, he's, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. when he gets an idea in his head, it can be kind of hard to get him off of it. And also, yeah. he, he, the personal chemistry piece is a big one. Pruitt okay. has really, really done a lot to make himself available to Trump. Um, and, and on deregulation, Pruitt has done a lot of what um, the president's backers have wanted, and that is a, a compelling rationale for the president, too. Let me ask you a bit about immigration, both in terms of California and national. The, the president's sort of emphasis, the Republican Party's emphasis, on more restrictive immigration, I'm putting it politely, more restrictive immigration policies. Does that help the party, do you think, both short-term in terms of the November election and then long-term in terms of appealing? And any one of you want, wants to pick up on that? I think that there's oddly been a, an opportunity for a lot of Republicans from you know, majority Hispanic congressional districts as a result of the president's conduct. I mean, here in California, uh, Jeff Denham and mm -hmm. David Valeto have tried to you know, get the discharge petition going to um, you know, force a vote on, on immigration. There are other Republicans from majority or plurality Hispanic districts like Carlos Corbello and Will Hurd who have been able to position themselves as relatively moderate because the president has gone so far. And you know, I would be a little bit agnostic about whether that was working if it weren't for what we just saw in the top two primary in California's 21st, where Vallejo's getting 63% of the vote. So it looks like it's doing something for him at least. Now, I don't know if that's going to go for everybody else, but you know, Hispanic voters are heavily concentrated in a small number of congressional districts in, in terms of the House battlegrounds. So in terms of this November, mm -hmm. you know, if the people who are vulnerable to, you know, 
uh, you know, the electoral consequences of high Hispanic turnout and anger are actually able to position themselves as moderate, then Republicans might actually be a little bit insulated in terms of this November on the issue. Over the long term, though, I mean, that's entirely, it's an entirely separate issue. Okay, I think we're going to move to question and answer from the audience. I'm seeing my cues right. Um, we have people with microphones, and uh, I can't really see, so it's going to be hard to pick people out. Um, oh, there we go. And again, the, uh, our only request is that you <coughs> end the sentence with a question mark and keep it short. Remember, there's a lot of people who want to answer questions and only oh. so much time. So, say what? Okay. I can't really see. So, if somebody. Yeah, I don't know where we're looking. I can randomly pick people. <laughs> that, that works. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Am I on? Thank you. Hi, this is a question for Nate. You alluded to polls and how off we were, and you sort of are feeling through the wilderness here about the next election. What are you guys going to, if you can't reach voters and you can't get reliable data, what are you looking for on the ground in the midterm elections in, in November? For, for what it's worth, my, my comment about the difficulty of being able to like get a full sample of voters was a was specifically about these really low turnout primaries where there are 25,000 people turning out. And getting 500 of those people to have picked up the phone is a, is a real stretch given how the small proportion of people who respond to telephone surveys nowadays. Uh, that concern doesn't exist as much in you know, a congressional race where there might be 200,000 or 250,000 people turning out. Uh, to like, answer the real you know, gist of your question, though, about like, you know, what do we think of polling right now, uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. And um, the polling industry has a lot of challenges. Uh, there's been a big decline in the number of people who respond to surveys. Turnout's always a problem. Uh, house race polling is particularly tough, in fact, because uh, the uh, number of people who, res who the number of people that you typically get per district, although enough for a poll, is less than you can get in the whole state. So maybe you get polls of 500 people, not 1,000, with margin of errors that are larger. A lot of people don't know who the House candidates are until the very end, so you end up with more undecided voters, and those people can break in certain directions at the end. So. Uh, you know, the individual polls might be less accurate than uh, they've been in the Senate or presidential races that we've gonna become more accustomed to, you know, looking at the polls in over the last decade. And then there's a final problem, which is that there are 60 congressional districts that we need to pay attention to, and there are only a handful of organizations that are spending money on high quality polls to cover them. So in any given race, we're gonna have like one or two polls that are not as good as usual. And so we're not gonna know that much. Um, you know, we're, it, the, the, the reporting end of it, I think, uh, and particularly the you know, reaching out to what the campaign committees do mm -hmm. and what they're looking at and what the campaigns are doing is really important because in public, we're gonna have two polls. Uh, but if we have the ability to tap into what the super PACs are looking at, what the campaign committees are looking at, what the candidates are looking at, now we have a little bit more to look at. Um, and even then, I still don't think we get an extremely crisp view of what's going on in these races. And so I just think there's gonna be a lot, of, I think people have to be prepared for the idea that there's gonna be a ton of uncertainty about you know, the overall direction of the House in particular. We might have a general sense that one side's favored, but I don't think that it's likely that heading into election day that we'll be able to say there are 218 districts, which is the number needed for a majority, in which the Democrats are very clearly favored, or the Republicans. I just think it's gonna be kind of a, a, mu a big mushy middle where we're open to the idea that either side can win. Nate, I assume it's going to be easier in 2020. Uh, my question is, were, do you think that pollsters took lessons from the problems of 2016 and there will be different procedures or different processes? Or, and with the caveat that, as I think you know, uh, clearly the national polls were right. It was yeah. just the state polls that were wrong. So, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be too arcane, but, you know, the state oh, polls have had this really, had, the, had, I think, a pretty particular problem in 2016, which is that they didn't account for the educational attainment of voters. And there's a really nerdy reason why the national polls can do that, that the state polls can't, that we won't get into. But let it suffice to say that the state polls had a problem dealing with education. And I think a lot of state pollsters are trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, not all of them, though. There was just a, some very good polls for the Democrats yesterday from Marist College that had the Democrats doing great in Ohio, and they have college-educated voters at 44% of, the register, of 44 of registered voters in their Ohio poll, and that is not true. You know, college, educate, college graduates are not 44% of registered voters in Ohio. They're not even close to that. And so, you know, there will, I think, be some polls that struggle to account for it, and it's a, I think it's still a concern going forward. But even if they fixed everything, I mean, you know, polling's tough, and, you know, even on the terms of historic polling era, even if polls are just as good as they've always been, you know, 
it's rarely a 100% proposition. It's rarely, you know, an overwhelming favorite. They're close to the end. In almost all elections, you know, someone, the other side can win going into election day. Okay. Um, um, over here? Or do you oh. have something? Yep. Hi, I'm back here. <laughs> I know this is somewhat uh, futuristic and we're talking about midterms, but uh, would you, and this is for the three of you, would you care to comment on something that a lot of people think about is who would be a viable candidate in 2020 and somehow put that together with the um, Senate race in, uh, in midterms between uh, O'Rourke. Viable presidential Who, candidate? Yes. No, I, and and Donald I, Trump's viable. Yeah. And no, and, uh, you mean Democratic candidate, Democratic right? candidate. And, and, it, and, then, I mean, and then connect that with uh, what's going on in uh, Texas between O'Rourke and uh, Cruz. And the other cat, just to make it more in doing that, could you also, in your view, talk, assess the sort of viability of two California people, uh, Kamala Harris and Eric Garcetti, he's the mayor of Los Angeles, um, as potential presidential candidates? Don't, I'm serious. Don't Are you? Be the, yeah. No, I just, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad, glad you added identify the Garcetti identifier. Yeah. 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 Do you want me to make one of you go first? No, sure. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, look, I'm, this is not going to, I'm not going to, um, like totally dodge your question, but um, I'm going to dodge it a little bit. Okay. Uh, you know, I think that one of the lessons that um, a lot of us drew from covering 2016 was that uh, the traditional standards of who's viable, who's legitimate, who's worth taking seriously, um, don't necessarily um, do us a whole lot of good uh, these days, not just because of um, Trump, um, but because of Bernie Sanders uh, on the Democratic side, and frankly, because, a lot, uh, because of a lot of the Republican candidates who, by any conventional metric, should have done really well, who turned out to be like super low energy. Um, not that you mean anyone to, in particular. To coin a phrase. So, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, you know, a member of the House is not a serious candidate, um, a member of the business community, a celebrity is not a, a serious candidate. I would say that Personally, the way I'm thinking about the Democratic field is um, the question of whether the party is going to want a healer or whether the party is going to want a, a warrior, a fighter uh, candidate. Are they going to want somebody who, you know, a sort of Obama or Bill Clinton style candidate who uh, want, will sort of go before the country and offer to um, bring the country together and sort of heal up the wounds of the last, um, you know, four to eight years? Uh, or is it going to be somebody who is going to say, no, I'm going to give me a chainsaw and send me to Washington uh, to, do, um, to do what you, to implement the agenda you want uh, implemented? And I would sort of put the, the two Californians in, um, in separate categories. But have the standards changed? In other words, like, there was a point where you would say, and I'm going to use Garcetti as an example because he's going, the idea of a Los Angeles mayor who, you know, who's never run for anything, I don't think we're city, except for city council before, being considered as a presidential candidate seems ridiculous. It, there was a time of that, but has the standards changed enough yes. um, one, yeah. in terms of what qualifies you to be a candidate for president, in terms of Democrats' hunger for a new, younger, okay. Well, they have, I mean, they have, um, the, the bench is kind of wide and not particularly deep, right? I mean, that's been the main complaint for a while. Right. Um, there are some people who I think are viewed as, as stronger than others. I think Alex is exactly right that the, the usual um, metrics don't work. And I think that, um, in it, I, I don't know if it's a third category, but an addendum to the categories that you mentioned. Um, one of the main complaints that you see from, from voters in their, or pollsters see from voters about Trump is about his tweeting habits. Um, and they don't like it. Even his, some of his own supporters don't like it. And what it speaks to is this larger question of being presidential. Um, and I do wonder how much voters are going to hunger for somebody who is traditionally presidential versus not. Um, the one way where I think that um, Trump is the, is the total anom anomaly, and this is not going to fit for somebody else, um, is... You know, I think there are a fair, there, there, as it happens, there are some wealthy people in this country who have political ambitions, and I think that wealthy people in this country look at, um, with political ambitions, look at Trump, and their lesson is, why not me? Um, and why not them? Because they haven't spent 30 years as part of the popular culture and 14 years on a television show that was pretty popular. Um, there, there is no one who can duplicate what Trump actually was, uh, and so I think that that's a standard that has to be kind of... You know, one really quick thing, I remember being in the newsroom the night that Trump won in uh, New York, and uh, Maggie was sitting at the terminal looking kind of stunned. The newsroom was kind of stunned. Um, and she turned to me and said, this is going to be really bad. Um, I did say that. And has it turned out as you expected? Yeah. Okay. 
This is a true story. I, it was no, like, this is a 100%. It was the 2 in the morning, morning yeah. right? Yeah, it was 2 in the morning. I don't remember if... I, I said, even called it yet. I said it to you. Nada called, called it. Yeah, Nada called it. Um, Alex was writing the, the, the news story. I, the, um, <coughs> I remember we were, we were talking, and then at another point we were, we were G-chatting, um, Google Hangouts. Um, yeah, it's a true story that I said that, and, and you seemed surprised that I said that, if memory serves. And yes, it has turned out exactly... We're stressed. Um, it turned out exactly as I thought it would, not necessarily specifically in the ways I thought it was, but, but pretty much. I mean, he, 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 he said exactly who, uh, this is one of the thing, the, um, complaints about the election. There's a lot of legitimate reasons to criticize the media coverage in 2016. Many, many, many. Um, but one thing that I, I continue to be surprised by is the people who say you didn't really show enough who he was. I think voters had a lot of information about him. And I think that there were a fair number of voters who already had an opinion of him based on The Apprentice, based on seeing him for years. But um, he made pretty clear, I mean, the, the travel ban that just got upheld was had its roots in a Muslim ban that he proposed in December 2015 after the Pulse nightclub shooting. Um, the um, the the smearing of political opponents, the targeting the press, um, the savaging of an opponent. Um, think of what he did to Hillary Clinton at that second debate mm -hmm. when he brought her husband's accusers to the debate and had them seated so she would have to walk past them. I think that's a pretty revealing act. Um, so uh, the way he has treated his staffers, the way he has cycled through them is all stuff that Alex and I wrote about during the campaign. Um, the way personnel matters more than policy to him in most ways is something we saw during the campaign. Um, and the way he prefers fighting and reverting to his base whenever there's uncertainty. Um, and and his, his indecisiveness as a, as a leader is something that I think actually gets underappreciated because the tweets seem like they're really decisive, but actually if you look at them, there's like three different statements about the same topic on the same day sometimes. Um, he, he's, he's, who, he's who we knew he would be. Okay, let's take another one. We have a question in the balcony. Okay. Oh, there, there's a balcony. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. Thanks. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, I have a very brief question. I just want to go back to the discussion of ocasio uh, cortez and the Crowley election. Uh, I found it very interesting, and I would just like you all to comment on why have you all uh, failed to describe ocasio cortez as she describes herself, which is as a democratic socialist? <laughs> Because um, I think we kind of have, but I'll, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I just, I mean, I read this coverage this morning and I, uh, yeah. that they all, this, at least the New York Times, I don't know about the Chronicle, but I think the Times, yeah, look, I think we they did. did. Yeah. So. I mean, I guess if you mean on this panel, I mean, because we were, we were talking about it in the context, frankly, of Crowley losing. Um, uh, so, uh, and because it was a democratic primary, um, that's why. I mean, I would also just say, I would say two things real fast. One is that, you know, candidates apply labels to themselves right. all the time, and right. uh, the media doesn't necessarily pick up the, the brand that they apply to themselves, right? right. So you had, uh, in the Tea Party wave, you had all kinds of people getting nominated, calling themselves you know, a constitutional conservative mm -hmm. or something like that, right? A, you know, a true conservative. And it's not a term that you necessarily use because that's, a, that's, a, that's branding, right. right? I do think democratic socialist, that's an important sort of uh, theme in the party right yes. now. I don't think we've actually underplayed that. And, and, and you know, right. one of our colleagues did a very, very in-depth story on uh, the sort of rise of self-identified socialists uh, on the left, not in the context uh, of that race. But, but I don't think anybody at the paper is sort of underestimating right. the significance of the emboldened, muscular, yes. uh, uh, very, very left left. Um, I would also just say it's extraordinary to me, um, uh, and, and I, I don't mean this to sound condescending at all, um, I think it's a remarkable reflection of where we are in politics right now that um, you know, a person in uh, San Francisco 24 hours after that primary, which like people in New York weren't even aware of uh, two days ago, would be that up to date on the race, the candidate, and have like a specific grievance about the media coverage uh, of that candidate. <laughs> and, and I say that truly respectfully because that is where we are now. We're at a, we're at a place right now where everything is, is super, super na yes. nationalized and where the sense of energy uh, and anger and indignation on the left is like nothing I've yes. seen in my you know, decade of doing this. Okay, let's take another we, we have uh, or time for two more questions. The okay. first one is over here. A uh, question for Maggie. Uh, does covering Trump stress you out? <laughs> 
Next. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not a beach day, but I mean, it's not, it's, um, <laughs> it's, no, that's a fine question to answer. It, it's a, this is a level, look, I mean, I think that the thing with Trump is that it's, um, it, the intensity and the pace has just never stopped. That's all. It's, 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 it's that's not all, but that's, that's a big part of it. Um, combined with the fact that, um, I, there is an understandable, and Alex was just speaking to this a bit, uh, level of anger. Uh, large level of anger um, uh, in the country on the left against Trump. I think that it gets um, directed at us uh, uh, more than we've ever seen. Uh, actually, not ever, but certainly more since the Iraq War, I would say. And um, uh, and I think that sometimes um, that can be a little a little disorienting. Um, but I, I think that the the pace of covering him is is I keep saying it's unsustainable, and yet here we are. So, Maggie, how long have you known him for? Did you know him back when you were at the Post? I had met him Your post. a couple of times at the Post, and I had covered him, you know, on like on infrequently. I dealt with him the most in 2011 when he was considering running for president slash becoming a birther, and um, and I dealt with him a lot. And that was sort of my main exposure to to how things work in his world because I did um, this long interview with Roger Stone, his longest serving political advisor about uh, what a Trump run would look like, about how much money he would spend and sort of how he would run. And Stone had all, it really holds up, honestly. If you Google it and Politico, my name and Roger Stone, 2011, it, it's like exactly what we saw him run on. Um, and, but Stone was saying all this stuff on the record about, you know, he's not that hard a worker and it's, it's, it's really something to watch. But, um, but he, um, uh, the next, but Stone was in all of these meetings with Trump during that period of time and a couple of other people who I knew from New York politics. And the next day, after the story ran, I got a call from Trump. Uh, who got on the phone. First, I got a note from him, which I think it was like he had written it and took a picture of it and they sent it to me. The big and, magic And emailed marker. it to me with yeah, a Sharpie. Right. And then, and then he, and then yeah. he, but, but then he called <laughs> in addition to sending the note and he said, Roger Stone doesn't speak for me. <laughs> I was like, what? Um, I don't understand what's happening here. But that's a lot of what, the Trump experience is like in terms of covering it. It's just figuring out what's the smoke and what's the mirror and what's not. Okay, one more, I guess. Um, hello? Sorry. Yes, um, uh, obviously, uh, I, I want to close by asking about the um, about uh, the election last night. Obviously, Ocasio-Cortez, she just got elected. She's not going to be speaker right away, but her election <laughs> and beating Crowley does show some discontent with the current Democratic leadership because, like you said, he was a candidate for speaker, and Nancy Pelosi is regrettably unpopular. Steny Hoyer has become unpopular after that tape came out about his meddling in Colorado. Um, who do you believe that some uh, candidates for House leadership among the Democrats would be in looking to the future and uh, taking into account this organic leadership you've been discussing? Just uh, feel free to riff any of you. <laughs> well, one of the really exciting things from a reporter's uh, standpoint about where sort of things stand in the House is if the current leadership team on the Democratic side sort of begins to crumble, the odds are relatively good that they will all go, right? That Nancy Pelosi is not going to leave if Steny Hoyer gets to stay, right? That that seems um, unfair to her uh, for fairly obvious reasons. Um, and so, and you know, Joe Crowley is the only one in his generation uh, in the House, the only sort of uh, under 70 but over 50 year old Democrat who seemed sort of naturally a position for that job. So, you know, if that leadership team goes down, it's kind of open season um, for those jobs in a way that we've actually not seen um, in either party, uh, certainly as long as I've been covering um, politics, as long as I've been following politics, um, which is, is longer than I've been covering it. Um, you know, uh, one of our colleagues, Jonathan Martin, um, and uh, uh, has a story with Cheryl Stolberg, the, the congressional correspondent, uh, this evening that sort of puts um, Elijah Cummings of Maryland uh, as somebody who could potentially um, be in the mix. There's uh, uh, Sherry Bustos, a, a, a no. relatively junior member from Illinois who's um, seen as really sort of savvy about red states uh, and, and sort of reaching out to rural America as somebody who's sort of seen as being interested and, and folks in California um, uh, see Adam Schiff as somebody who's sort of in the mix in the event that you've heard of him. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't even begin to handicap that kind of race because, you know, especially in a scenario if Democrats do end up electing a massive new class 
uh, to the Congress. You know, these are not people who are going to go in having relationships with any of the folks mm -hmm. I just mentioned, and, and they're not going to have sort of favors to, that they have to pay back to somebody uh, who's already sort of been interested in leadership for years. Maggie, you want to wait on that? Or? I couldn't say anything better than what Alex okay. just said. Uh, let's give a round of applause to Maggie Hiraman, <laughs> Nate Cohn, Alex Burns for joining us tonight. Um, you're going to be getting an email tomorrow asking you if you haven't already to sign up for California Today, so please do. Um, I'm Adam McGurney. Uh, let's give a thank you to Inforum at the Commonwealth Club and to the New York Times and don't forget your tote bags. Have a great evening. Thank you for being a <laughs> terrific audience. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>